असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय नृत्योर्मा अमृतंगमय ओं शांति 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 टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी द नेचर ऑफ इग्नोरेंस एंड द मेकॅनिझम ऑफ अध्यास बिकॉज यू सी अंदाज वी अंडरस्टँड द नेचर ऑफ इग्नोरेंस इन अस वाय आर टॉक वेन वी सी मुक्ती unless we do know how we are bound why will we seek for the boundless so this understanding this is a special fruit of agvait vedant that just through understanding you arrive at an insight into the truth what is the nature of adhyas uh, i mean ignorance like it is called agnyan so the nature of this agnyan is quite inscrutable it is also otherwise called maya one of the famous definitions in of maya agnyan in brihadaranika upanishad is avidyaya avidya prameva tu lakshanam the nature of this avidya is it generates ignorance and it is inscrutable you can't explain it in any way just like how you can't explain darkness isn't it you just have to bring in light and the darkness will vanish but you can't find a, an explanation for darkness so it is something like that but we will go by definition and see how exactly vedanta tries to understand avidya or agnyan the characteristics of agnyan are due to the powers of what are called avarna and vikshepa shakti so maya has these two powers which means it covers the reality avarna it is called and vikshepa means it projects that reality as something else so now you if you check and see in our own system we don't know what the self is there is an avarna over it as it were and we know ourselves to be falsely the body and mind alone so this is how avarna and vikshepa shakti function together it's bad enough not to know reality but to know it as something else is even worse isn't it so this is how we are made to believe to be to be something else we are identified with something else and we never doubt that identity that is why we remain in ignorance we are happy and comfortable with our ignorance so this is the nature of agnyan and the mechanism through which this ignorance functions is what is called adhyas actually speaking adhyas is a very interesting phenomenon and we will study it in a certain depth because it is important to know agnyan and adhyas and how they function in order to overcome the problems that they cause although we are not going to go very deep into it because we you just can't go very deep into darkness the technical definition of agnyan which you find in books like vedanta sar it it goes something like this you see what you can make out of it agnyanam tu sadasabhyam anirvachaniyam trigunatmakam gnana virodhi bhava roopam yat kinchit vadati iti aham agnya ityadi anubhavat this how it goes it means to say see agnyan its nature is sadasabhyam anirvachaniyam you can't say what it is what it is not if it is it belongs to the category of reality or unreality if it is there or it is not and you can't express it in words and trigunatmakam yet it shows the characteristics of the three gunas bhava gnana uh, virodhi it is the opposite of knowledge that is why it is ignorance it causes ignorance and bhava roopam yet it is something positive the absence of knowledge is not called ignorance ignorance is a positive covering over the real nature of things yat kinchit vadati aham agnya so it's difficult it's inscrutable in a way to explain and the mechanism through which it is functioning it is what is called adhyas or superimposition so this is one of the very important subject matters in vedant you will find this 
uh, the actual description of Adhyas in a small way in the introduction to Brahma Sutras in Shankar Bhashya. So, he, when he is introducing the Brahma Sutras, in his commentary there, you find this Adhyas Bhashya, the theory of superimposition, which makes a lot of sense in understanding the nature of our ignorance, how exactly this mechanism functions. See, let me start by giving you examples which you can find right now. It is a, a kind of first-person research that we are going to conduct now. There is an important uh, system of philosophy called phenomenology. It actually means creating first-person experience. How does something feel to me? So that is a very authentic and valid way of searching through knowledge. So now we are going to apply that and see how exactly Adhyas is affecting us. Check and see, your body does not say I. It is a machine that is going on by itself. Nor does the mind say I. But I say I am the body and mind. How does this happen? It's a mysterious phenomenon actually. How do I tend to superimpose? I on the body and mind where it does not belong. Because nothing in your body is taking your permission to function. It is functioning independent of you actually. The creator has not left any of our vital functions into our hands. Knowing how unreliable we are, he has kept it in his own hands. So it's functioning by itself like a machine. But I claim I am the body. The body does not claim an I. Nor does your thought process. It is going on as per your sanskars, your past impressions and your memories. But you claim I am the mind. Now what is do, making this claim? The body is a perfect object of your perception. The mind also is an object of your perception. Obviously they are apart from you. But you claim I am the body and mind. Although in real life experience, the body is not I. I, the body belongs to me. I have this body, but the body is not I. You have the mind. The mind belongs to me, but I am not the mind. Not, nor do any of these claim an I. But we have this tendency to superimpose the I on these two. Superimposition basically means this. See, if I place one object upon the other, like say, my right hand over my left hand, it is called an imposition. But I mis if I mistake the right hand for the left hand, it is superimposition. I am mistaking one thing for the other. It is basically an error in your intellect. And that is why knowledge is the only solution to remove an error in the intellect. It is a misperception, a misapprehension in the buddhi. And that is why if you just know the nature of ignorance, you can overcome it. You can throw it off just to understanding. That is the value of knowledge. It really removes darkness, unasked, unsought. Just bring in knowledge and maya will vanish. Bhagavad Gita says, there is nothing more purifying than knowledge. It is really the light that removes darkness. But who understands this? The yogi who has, who has known the nature of the mind, the core truth about our being. He understands this best that just through knowledge you can remove ignorance. The insights generated by knowledge. So, Adhyas is a mysterious phenomenon which has occurred because of lack of knowledge. Because we have assumed something without investigation. And Adhyas shows us our exact position of bondage. Please see. The bondage, the error lies in your buddhi, in your intellect, nowhere else. The world is we are is a reality as it is. Everything is as it is. Your buddhi is superimposing one thing on the other. It has superimposed your very identity on something you are not. So, Adhyas is not a metaphysical or philosophical abstraction. 
It is an analysis of the view and nature of things, of the nature of bondage or ignorance. And so it is a very important subject matter in uh, in this Adhyas, not just this Adhyas Bhashya, in Vedanta itself. Many introductory texts will show, will give you this idea of superimposition and the nature of ignorance and then proceed towards the realization of truth. This is how we are bound. So this is what is required to release you from bondage. This has to be primarily understood. You must feel the truth of Adhyas in your own system. This is the most essential point to catch. Unless Adhyas is felt, you will not ask for Mukti. Unless this existential sorrow is felt of making such a mistake regarding our own identity, I will not try to search my true identity. I will be happy functioning as a body and mind and going through its own streams of sorrows and joys. So this is the great equation which Shankaracharya actually gives us. He says, Agnyan leads to Adhyas. Adhyas leads to misplaced identity, which generates love and hate, which generates, which causes karma, the performance of action to get more and more from life and to get out of any form of negativity. And as a result, it causes future births. One continues in the cycle of birth and death only due to the fact of adhyas. You don't know who you truly are. So you are trying to be a better and better being, manifested being. If you only knew who you truly are, you would dive into your own true being, not try to be something else. So, by definition, Adhyas has very interesting definitions. See, one definition of Adhyas is Satya Andrita Mithuni Karanam Adhyasaha, which means you are mixing up the real and the unreal. I will illustrate this to you with an example. Another definition of Adhyas is you are actually, um, it's called Atasmin Tadbuddhi, which means you are finding an object at the wrong locus where it does not exist. And it is also said, Smriti Rupaha Paratra Purva Dushta Avabhasaha Adhyasaha, which means through memory, you are finding something at a completely wrong place and you are convinced of it. You are actually finding it there where it does not exist. How we manage to do this, it is really a mysterious phenomenon. To illustrate this, which actually contradicts our first-person experience. You see, Adhyas actually contradicts your first-person experience. You are always only primarily aware. In that awareness, there is a thought process through which you identify with the body and with the world of objects. But we have reversed this existential fact and we believe we are the thought, the mind and the body and relating to an absolutely objective world. So this is the strange phenomenon result of Adhyas. If you check and see, it really contradicts the first person experience. And it is only when we don't investigate into Adhyas that we remain a bound being. When we don't investigate into our true, true nature of the phenomenological aspect of life, how it actually feels to me that we understand how grossly we get identified with the body and mind, and remain content with that identification. You see, when anger is in your mind, you say, I am angry. That's not true. Anger is a vritti in my mind. It has come up, it can go down also. Due to various factors, it has come up, it can go down. That doesn't mean I am angry. Joy is a vritti in your mind. It came up, it goes down also. That means I am joyous. Again, I am alternating between different emotions. How the eye comes into the picture is a real, real mystery. This is because of our great identification with the body-mind complex, because we don't recognize this fundamental fact of our awareness. We are fundamentally aware and only through being identified with a body and mind. To capture this in first person is to get rid of ignorance. To capture this in personal experience 
not as a theory, not as a philosophy, not as somebody's bhashya, but in my own experience, is to get rid of adhyas. So for this, there's a, there's a famous story which I will tell you. I have modified the story a little to suit our modern needs. See, this is the famous analogy of the rope and the snake. Suppose you were walking home and your home is uh, at, at a, uh, close to a hill and there's a kind of uh, grassy path towards your home. And on the way, it, it is twilight hour, evening dusk, and there's very little light. So on the way, you suddenly saw something like a rope. Or something coiled lying down there. But when you went closer, you saw it is glistening. And also there is some kind of moment. It appears like that. So suddenly it occurred to you that this must be a snake. This is not a rope. Now you step back. Fear gripped your heart. And you started feeling, oh my God, there's a snake. I better not go through this path. Then if you still have your senses intact, you will try to further ponder upon this. Can it be a rope or a snake? And you have your mobile in your pocket. You can always jibbo it and throw some torch light on it to clear it, to clearly see whether it is a rope or a snake. Suppose you do that, you suddenly find that, no, no, it's a rope. You threw more light on the matter and you saw it's only a rope. You jumped over the rope and went home. But if fear gripped your mind and you found this impossible to uh, fi uh, decipher what it is, then you, you stepped back and you ran away and you alerted your neighbors and all of you came with a stick to kill the snake and finally found that nothing is there. It's only a rope. You can do either of these. So the essential point is if you just throw more light on the matter, you will find out what it is. What they are trying to tell us is, you must throw more light on adhyas that is happening in your own system. This in, at twilight hour when there is insufficient light, you tend to confuse something for what it is not. The rope in your own system is the Atman, the Self. The snake is the body-mind complex. You have mistaken this rope for the snake. You think, I am the body and mind. Now, how to change this? You must throw more light on the matter. It, it basically means you must enhance and augment your awareness. Awareness is the light which will tell you the real nature of things. So, how to enhance and augment awareness? That is the whole point in Vedant. Actually speaking, there is no enhancing and augmenting awareness because the self is ever as it is. Your mistake was only thinking that the Atman is the body and mind. Only thinking that the rope is the snake. So if you remove the ignorance in the mind, here throwing more light amounts to that. If you remove the ignorance in the mind, you will find the only reality is the rope. The snake was never there. You don't get rid of the snake by bringing a stick and beating it or shouting or alerting your neighbors. You get rid of it just by throwing more light. And that means removing the error in your buddhi. Bringing awareness into full fruition in your system. Through Vedant. That is the only way to get rid of adhyas. So please watch this slide, which will give you this whole thing in uh, picture form. Now what happens as a result of this when you throw more light? It results in the superimposition. <laughs> Knowledge in Vedant is of the nature of the superimposition. You are removing the error in your buddhi, that's all. You are getting rid of it. You don't bring in another reality. You are not inventing something through your thought. It's not a thought construct, the self. You are just knowing reality as it is. 
That is why this is also called realization. Realization means something is already there. I realize now that it is there. I was not seeing it. Now I saw it. So it is only a realization, a final perception in your buddhi. Drishyate Tvagraya Buddhaya Sukshmaya Sukshma Dashivi. This is how the Upanishad puts it. It is known by those of very refined subtle intellects because it is already present. Only it is sort of covered up. You have to remove your wrong identification and reality will shine forth by itself in a very refined mind. Through a very refined intellect you can grasp this. They are telling you. So knowledge is of the nature of de-superimposition in Vedant. And what is the criteria of reality? How do you know something is real? This is also very important to know in Vedant. See, only when you know something to be real, you will pursue it. They are telling you now, the self is the reality about you. So what is the definition of the real reality? There are three definitions in Vedant. One is that which is real is absolutely unchanging. It remains the same always. The real nature of the Atman never changes. It is pure consciousness. But the body and mind are ever changing. That is why the Atman is considered real and the body-mind unreal. Secondly, that which is real is unnegatable. It is called Badarahityam. It, is, it cannot be negated. It is the most primary substratum of whatever is being perceived. This unnegatability characterizes truth. You cannot refute it. Because it is of the nature of unchanging reality. And it is self-luminous by itself. That is the third definition of reality. It does not require anything else to validate its existence. Just like how you don't require a torch to illumine the sun. The sun charges your torch to its energy, to solar energy. You don't require the torch to illumine the sun. The sun is all self-luminous. You only have to look up to it. So also, reality is like that. It is numinous in itself. Consciousness is that which renders everything conscious. The mind and body complex through the body-mind, the world of objects. How may, what will you use to know the self, to human consciousness itself? You don't require anything. All that is required is stop the wrong identification with the body and mind. In a very clear state of intellect, you will know the nature of the self. So this self-luminosity, it, it is a characteristic of reality. It is called Swayam Prakash in Sanskrit, which means it is numerous in itself. It does not require anything else to illuminate. Only pure awareness has this quality. Only con pure consciousness has this quality, that it is self-luminous. It does not function on borrowed light. It renders everything else conscious. It renders the mind conscious, it renders the body conscious. And we tend to identify with whatever has become conscious. So this is the nature of reality as described in Vedant. And knowledge is the only way to cut through ignorance generated by Adhyas. It is only by knowing reality that you get rid of the error of misplaced identity. With this, we will conclude today's session. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace.